What are capture the flag challenges anyway? Um, first of all, the, it's about hacking, as you all guess, and then capture the flag is like um, a scoring system of the challenge so that finally you end up in a setup where there are multiple teams competing and hacking each other and you got a kind of a system to evaluate who, who performs best so that, well, in the best case, you would have a full ordered system in the end where you see which teams uh, perform best. Um, Yeah, uh, what does, how does this work exactly? There are typically each team receives a um, uh, server image which they have to set up. The server image deliberately contains a lot of vulnerabilities. Most of them are quite trivial, some are harder to detect. And if the, by the time the contest starts, all teams have to, um, find the vulnerabilities in their own images, trying to fix them out and exploit them at the other teams so that if you found a vulnerability, you can um, try to get into the other team's systems. Uh, if you get into a system, you typically find a uh, a lot of information there. Some of them is deliberately left there by the organizers of the system and you can submit it to, in a central location. Uh, to prove that you're right, that you hacked another system. For every piece of information that you submitted, you receive scores and you actually transfer the scores from the defending party's score, uh, amount of scores to your own scores. So the more flags you get, the more scores a, a team gets, and I think we will end up with no slides at all. So, um, Okay, so now there we are. Yes, uh, the services are tested for functionality every now and then by the organization, of course automatically by the scoreboard. If the services are not up and running, which is one of the central points of the contest, then a team of course gets no defensive points. Uh, so one of the possibilities to get better than the other teams is just trying to disturb the availability of their services. Uh, the second possibility is just hack into the services and steal the information that is left there by the organization 
And the third, of course, is to have your own services running all the time, not being disturbed by the attacks of the other teams, despite of the vulnerabilities that they are included in the source code. Uh, a third possibility to get points, which is quite new in the kind of CTF games, is that if people find vulnerabilities, they are encouraged to write advisories and send them to the organization. These advisories are then scored for style and completeness, which again is a third kind of scores. These scores are then all added and, well, we know that. Then. Why should I waste my time to play these games? The first, but obviously wrong, is to win it. The actual mot motivation to play Capture the game Flag games is to learn new ways of exploitation, to learn getting hit by exploits, and of course to have fun. Then, what do you learn in these games? Of course, they are not for re real professional hackers, they are more for, uh, designed for students and those who want to learn hacking. Um, well, first you train your programming skills because in these games you'll meet source code that was written by other people. And, well, of course, admittedly, it's typically written in a very bad style, but you <laughs> learn how other people write and you learn how to make it better then typically you learn or you develop on your own very innovative defensive skills, how to defend a system that, is, that contains as many holes as a Swiss cheese. Um, you learn to work under pressure. And I think the most important is that people see where software breaks in real scenarios. Well, if students learn security in universities, they typically just learn that deploying certificates, deploying encryption leads to a 100% secure software. This is obviously not the case. So here's the point where we teach students where, at which point software really breaks in real systems. Then what won't you learn? at these systems, it's real life pen testing. Real, real, real systems work a little bit different than these capture the flag games, but we've seen that in the last talk. Then um, if you want to p participate in the capture the flag game, the first thing you need is someone to set it up. Um, the organize and um, the organizers need to have really a lot of spare time to set up because, as we'll see later on, all the services that are deployed in these Capture the Flag games are typically customly written. They are not something like a ready-to-take buggy Apache, uh, like 1.0.0.0 alpha, pre-release one. So you need a lot of time to write these systems. Um, Typically, you would like to know as an organization, as a hoster of these games, where the software will be break, so you need the expertise of exploiting the systems on your own. Uh, you need to be vicious to insert some really hard to, bind, hard to find bugs so that people after a while will recognize that they're getting exploited, but they, but they don't know where it is. And of course, there are a lot of questions in these games, so being responsive is obviously a plus. For the players, if you participate, um, it's, well, it seems trivial to say that people should know basic exploitation techniques and they should know about defending systems and programming, but uh, in my experience of Capture the Flag games, there are teams where not a single participant could program. There are teams that can't set up IP tables. There are teams, um, who gave away their root passwords to the administration. There are teams, well, these, this list could be, um, could be really long, but, um, so, if you, I, I think one of the best things to do actually for future Capture the Flag games would be to set up an, 
uh, page where the teams submit their participation request and they already would have to solve some minor SQL injection or something like that just to sort out the strong ones from the weak ones. Um, our experience is also that if you want to set up a capture the flag game, it's futile to have teams that are larger than 10 people or smaller than five because in one way you would end up with having too less manpower if you are too less people or otherwise you would have so many internal communication problems that um, some problems are not covered at all or a lot of people tend to do the same and don't recognize it. And of course, players of Capture the Flag games would need to be able to read and understand English text, something that is not obviously because like only 10% of all the players read the rules, read what a flag is, read how the scoring system works, otherwise it's uh, not able to explain how the outcome of some capture the flag games is. So um, if you're up to host a capture the flag game or if you're going to participate, take all the information that's available, read it once or at least, or even better twice, just to be sure that you didn't miss a point. Um, of course, capture the flag games need to have rules. Um, although being a hacking challenge would imply to some people that the absence of rules is a must. Um, we need to have some rules because um, fun is one of the crucial parts of the game and if everybody just uh, does what they do what they want that the complete game will end up in, in havoc. Um, first of all um, we've got to very good experience with explaining all rules before the game. Otherwise, if there's a referee decision on unethical behavior, people, uh, players will just complain and, um, well, the, the fun is gone. Um, we also suggest that um, unethical behavior like deleting vital system files or shutting down other people's servers um, should not be done because the time for recovering from these um, heavy blows takes too long for a typical capture the flag game so that the fun from the team that is hit is uh, just gone and um, well this is just plainly not p fair play and if I have a root shell on another system it's a much better use for it is just to install a kernel level backdoor or whatever and just getting all the flags from the system. Um, yeah, But anyway, enforcement of any rules is typically not possible because in some ways the players are distributed all over the game and just connected all over the world and connected by VPNs so that um, if I'm not there, I can't check whether their system contains some illegitimate firewall rules or whether they do some other kernel level filtering or contain packs as e Linux or whatever. So just anyway, logging is suggested at the central point just to make sure that if, uh, if some team disbehaves, then you can prove it later on. Then other typical rules are that just um, cheating on the team size is, uh, well, trivial, I think, like if I have a rule that says no teams above 10 people and there's one team having 20 people, then this team, of course, has an advantage. So uh, the problem is, again, that it's typically impossible to prove that a team in a remote capture the flag game has a certain team size. So just have to believe that. Intentionally supporting other team is the same. Um, yeah, just sticking to the last one, um, that last ones that no automated stack protections techniques or other things like that are allowed in capture the flag games because the participants are not supposed to work around flags with uh, vulnerabilities without understanding them. So these will destroy the fun of the game. So it's forbidden. Um, the same applies to 
denial of service uh, attacks that just uh, drop down the availability of other teams without really um, making the attackers understand why or how they shut down the other system. Um, just skip a little bit because we're back in time. Um, then, just sorry. Yeah, the basic thing about um, all capture the flag games are uh, the challenges. Um, each challenge is typically consisted of a single service that is connected to the network so that the other, peop uh, other teams can access it. Um, there are some very simple rules about these um, services that would have to be deployed or at least, at least ensured while writing these services just to make sure that the fun remains in the game. The first is that under any condition you have to avoid a, a root exploit on the system, otherwise if somebody hacks this service and gets root shell, he can uh, delete the system, he can read all the information from all services and not only from the one he compromised. So, um, well, this is just to be avoided, otherwise he would have an unfair advantage. Um, then the reason not to take out of the box services is of course that there's no time to develop zero-day exploits and capture the flag games. Um, and that we don't want to enforce participants looking for vulnerabilities using Google's or just like experienced players uh, knowing the vulnerabilities from databases like um, Bugtrack. Instead, players should uh, look for the vulnerabilities on their own. We also just can't modify these services because otherwise people could just download the original source, do a diff, and then they got all the vulnerabilities. So as I already said, we have to stick up with writing custom services, typically using standard protocols because these are known to the players and the players can develop very fast a good feeling for what a service does and where the vulnerabilities are. Um, the programming languages in the capture the flag should be adopted to the typical use of systems that can be found somewhere. Um, of course, PHP, Perl, C, Bash, and so on, they are encountered in nearly every capture the flag. Um, in some occasions, there's Java and Python, quite unusual and never seen, or basic and Pascal languages. This doesn't mean that they will never occur in a CTF, just they are quite uncommon and if the hoster of a CTF game wants to add a little spice, they can just use unusual programming languages. Um, to the difficulty of the task, it's um, so that the capture the flag games are not designed for professional hackers, as I already said in the beginning, but for students. So there have to be vulnerabilities that are so damn stupid that they will never occur in a normal course, uh, in a normal source. Um, this is also a little bit important for the bootstrapping of the game. Otherwise, people just analyze the code and there's nothing happening in the first three hours. And so um, we, we want to change that because after all, uh, capture the flag games are about fun. Um, and uh, another reason to avoid just services that only contain very difficult services is that we, well, the time of the hosters and the time of the players is precious, of course. We want to avoid that they start analyzing code and there's no result until the end of the capture the flag. This, again, is something that is, has to be avoided. Um, unfortunately, in the experience, it's um, that there aren't too easy, that there aren't just too easy tasks. Um, in nearly every capture of the flags, there are some programming lines like uh, system, quotation mark, um, ls star, uh, or some ls 
system calls in C files or in Perl scripts that can be very trivially used for shell injection, but um, there are always some teams that never fix them until the end of the game. So um, I think maybe that some teams should better not only do the capture the flag game itself, but only analyze what happened to their image during the game and learn from it for the next time. So this could improve something. Um, I, I, th I think I could uh, show some examples of Capture the Flag services, or at least part of them. Here's a part of a guest book that has been used in the ICTF2 from the UCSB University, where we uh, see a typical um, CTF-style programming where we have a Perl script, a Perl CGI that copies everything to global namespace and um, then just uses a shell command. Um, again, this is something where um, some teams are unable to fix it, but most teams get that they just have to um, what, replace the first lines with, um, with just copying the interesting parameters and then just um, filter out all evil escape, shell escape characters. Um, another vulnerability that is that is sometimes used in PHP is just taking hidden content from um, from the user and then executing code that is typically not executed during the normal during the normal course of the uh, scoring system. This part is, um, these lines are taken from the ICTF05 that has just been happened in the beginning of December, where there was just a file that has never been used by the scoreboard, and it's in the, it was in the same directory as uh, all the other files that were patched and checked by the players. But since it wasn't used by the scoreboard, most players didn't took a look at it and, um, well, it contained something that's just kind of a trivial backdoor where you only have to enter the service name in a cookie and it lists all the flag. Um, uh, another damn stupid style of programming, well, we already got that. Um, Yeah, uh, f yeah, it's the same, it's just not system, but p-open with, with basically the same. Um, the, the, sometimes it's quite nice to, to have these lines where, where, where you enter just one line of shellcode and it's uh, quite difficult to replace with um, the original programming file, uh, programming language. In this case, it would be easy, but um, if it's not just a cat but a grape, crap or whatever. Um, yeah, just just some more. Oh, yeah. And then there's, um, of course, the more advanced uh, vulnerabilities where we have these um, uh, chat server where you could have a channel and what people didn't recognize was that the channel that you joined where the flag was posted was not um, checked as a string but as a regular expression so people could just enter uh, a lot of channels by regular expression and then get all the broadcast messages. Um, this was so difficult to find that no team up to the end fixed it. Um, A, a similar, a little bit different vulnerability was here where you got an SQL injection and in the first place you just think, oh, how, wow, there's password. I got it from the CGI script. It's sanitized and then used in the query. And um, here just the, the last character. 
is the um, single quote. And um, so if people don't just check carefully, uh, they, they miss it. And so, so you can still do SQL injection and um, because uh, with a backtick you can here uh, escape the end the password and then just um, enter something like or one and um, so so it's sometimes quite quite viciously hidden um, and sometimes it's just um, a little bit more stupid like um, where, where you have a, a check and even in the source code you have an encrypted flag and a plain flag and, and if the length that you return is negative you just get the plain flag and otherwise you get the encrypted flag. Um, these are things where um, where some where, where you have to pay attention that um, if, if you enter these things in your code, you might end up with some teams exploiting them very fast and others just don't find it. Um, some of the most difficult challenges that um, can be deployed in these capture the flag games are those where you have a remote execution by design, like in the, um, in the 22C3 capture the flag that has happened this morning where you just could send shell code to another uh, to another team server that has to be executed because it's part of the service and then you just get the return code. This is what how it was programmed and um, so the task is not how to prevent ex uh, other teams to execute shell code because then the, term, the service is down but you have to sanitize the, the code Otherwise, you you just shut down the service and you don't receive any defense points. And um, I, I think when the service was designed, there was actually no no clue how to no real clue how to prevent teams uh, exploiting this service. And I, I even think that it's kind of impossible to prevent all possible exploitations of this. But um, um, well, actually, there was one. One team really fixed it. They they put it in the, the change rule stuff. Yeah, but this <laughs> 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 was, was quite oh, yeah. nice in my opinion. So yeah, it was but, quite nice. And well, depends on it. Yeah, it, it, the, it it worked for the capture the flag, yeah. but it it well, yeah, but uh, one hundred percent fixing yeah. is typically not possible. So, and, and um, yeah, the, the worst thing to happen is something like you have a service without source code um, that, is, that provides a service on the SSL, uh, that is encrypted in SSL, so you can't sniff the data, you can't read the source code, you have to uh, reverse engineer the service. Um, uh, I, I don't know if this can be done in, uh, real time during a capture the flag game, but well, offline it can be done, of course. Um, additional possibilities to, uh, to have the players more fun in, in the game is just assigning weak passwords, uh, some backdoors in the image. Um, it's, it's surprising how, less, how little attention is paid to weak passwords I think yesterday in the um, competition, there were like two or three services having username equals password passwords, and some teams took three hours to find that out. Um, so, Yeah, um, just some more final small notes on capture the flag games. They are um, for hosters at least and for the participants uh, some common pitfalls. One of them is, um, I just have small um, words here to remind me, 
is uh, that there are sometimes teams that are unable to install VMware to set up their routing. And so if these teams can only participate if they give their root passwords to the organizers so that the organizers install their systems, um, this is something that typically should be avoided, but it happens all the time. Um, the same applies to people that don't understand that they should hack the other team's boxes, but instead hack their own boxes, and if they submit the flags, they obviously always get the message from the flag server that these are their own flags, that they could have access with their own root password from their own machines, and after hours, they still submit their own flags. Um, we, we also experienced that if we had some widely distributed capture the flag, that if in the vicinity of our university there was some intrusion after a CTF, people complained that that could have been some other teams that would like to take revenge for ours. Um, th this is just, uh, well, if you participate in the capture the flag, just have some, some advice for the other people in your environment handy if they just complain that you or somebody else from the capture the flag hack their system. And um, yeah, of course, capture the flags with two less or too much teams is obviously also no fun. Um, from the technical point of view, there's just uh, 